Turn it over to John. Well, this was an easy one. Uh, started out thinking about something that happened, but it would have happened a little earlier on, but I got to relating it to today with kids and their cell phones. Anyway, a young fellow was walking along the road one day, and he found a copper penny laying on the road, so he picked it up, put it in his pocket, and he was excited. It didn't cost him anything. He said, now he's got a penny. Well, he kept doing that for, for years and years. He walked around with his head down, not looking around, but his, his head down. And sure enough, over the run of, his, run of his working life, 40 years or so, he found 302 pennies, 24 nickels, 41 dimes, eight quarters, three half dollars, a worn out paper dollar, and a little bit more. So here he's got 12 to 15 dollars worth of money that he's just found walking around with his head down. But what did he miss? Well, over that period of time, he probably missed about 23,000 sunsets, 175 rainbows, the beauty of the white clouds floating above, birds soaring around, squirrels hopping across the road from branch to branch in the trees, and the brilliance of the color of the autumn leaves, and what had he acquired? That's what he missed out on by just keeping his head turned down. If you look around today, every time you walk around, there's somebody coming through the parking lot, walking down the street with their punching on the telephone, doing something, and they're not looking around and they're missing a whole lot. And there's one fella in town, I've got to tell this one, I'm not going to mention any names, but he walks around looking, he does look at everything. He's always looking. And I saw him walking to a telephone pole the other day. I thought that was a cute thing. But he's always looking at his nose to see what's going on around the neighborhood. But that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. I was talking to somebody the other day about going through, uh, as a kid, going through the phone booths and reaching in. Kids won't remember that. Reaching in, trying to find quarters. And the... I call it no nines, no nines. But we used to see this man reaching in telephone things. Every time he went by pay phone. Yep, yeah. <laughs> that was a habit I formed as a kid. Boy, I tell you, I couldn't twelve dollars and eighty something cents, so not worth it. Thanks, John. That made me think. All right, our old testament lesson is in the old testament. Numbers. The book of Numbers. And we are in the 21st chapter, 4th through 9th verses. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. So this, the, they is the Israelites marched from Mount Hor on the Reed Sea Road around the land of Edom. The people became impatient on the road. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us in the desert where there is no food or water? And we detest this miserable bread. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people and they bit the people. Many of the Israelites died. The people went to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and you. Pray to the Lord, so that he will send the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous snake and place it on a pole. Whoever is bitten can look at it and live. Moses made a bronze snake and placed it up on a pole. If a snake bit someone, that person could look at the bronze snake and live. And then our other scripture lesson today, which is our gospel lesson, is found in the book of John, the third chapter, the 14th through 21st verses. Little background as you're turning. This, is, uh, this takes place during Nicodemus' nighttime visit to talk to Jesus. John three fourteen through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so that the human one 
so must the human one be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world and people love darkness more than the light for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen and that their actions were done in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me now? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you this day. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Next Saturday... We will no longer be Americans. On Saturday, the colors that make up our flag will no longer be red, white, and blue. A lot of people will be seeing little men with red beards, pointed ears, wearing green pants, a green coat with a gold-trimmed waistcoat, a wide brim hat, and smoking a pipe. If you happen to catch one of these little men, they will grant you three wishes. Perhaps if you're extremely lucky, you'll discover their pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Of course, you know by now I'm speaking of St. Patrick's Day, which people will celebrate around the world on March 17th. Now, St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland. According to Patrick's autobiography, The Confessio of Patrick, He was actually born in Britain when it was under Roman control around the 5th century of the Common Era. At the age of 16, he was captured by Irish pirates. No wonder I like this story. Irish pirates and taken as a slave to Ireland where he lived for six years before escaping and returning to his family. Then he became a cleric. And he returned to the northern and western parts of Ireland in order to convert the pagans who lived there. In later life, he served as an ordained bishop, and by the 7th century, he had already become, uh, come to be revered as the patron saint of Ireland. March 17th is the historical date of his death, around 461 of the Common Era. Now, one of the symbols of St. Patrick's Day is, of course, the shamrock, which is basically a three-leafed clover. According to the legend, St. Patrick used shamrocks to explain the concept of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, while trying to convert people to Christianity. But the popular notion of them we- uh, wearing them did not begin until the 1600s. Perhaps the most common myth about St. Patrick is that he drove all of the snakes out of Ireland. The absence of snakes in Ireland gives rise to the legend and that all of the snakes had been banished by St. Patrick, who chased them into the sea after they attacked him during a 40-day fast he was undertaking. Truthfully, though, the cold water surrounding Ireland would never have allowed snakes to migrate onto the island nation. But still, it's a nice legend. In all likelihood, the legend of St. Patrick banishing the snakes was just a metaphor for him ridding the country of the old, evil, pagan ways. While snakes played a mythical role in the history of this country and its patron saint, they played an even more important role in the Bible, as we've just heard. In Genesis, the serpent led to men's fall from grace. Snakes appear in the Exodus story as Moses and Aaron's staffs turn into snakes in front of Pharaoh and Aaron's devours the snakes created by Pharaoh's sorcerers. In Acts 23, 8, Paul is bitten on the hand by a viper hidden in a bundle of brush he collected to put in a fire. And that brings us to our Old Testament lesson today. Let me set the stage for you a little bit. The 
people of Israel are wandering in the desert, still searching for the promised land. Aaron, Moses' brother, and the chief priests of the people had just died and been buried, and the people had just completed their 30 days of mourning. As the assembly picked up and moved again toward Canaan, the Canaanite king of Arad decided that he didn't like the fact that the Israelites were coming through his land. So he amassed his army and set them upon them, taking some of them captive. Israel prayed to God again for deliverance and promised to destroy both the king and his people and their city. God heard their prayer and Israel did indeed defeat them. Now as they set out from Mount Hor, they travel along the Red Sea of to avoid going through the land of Edom because their king refused to grant them safe passage. So to continue their journey, they had to go around it. And this delayed them on their journey to the promised land. Also, the route was extremely difficult. Their water supply was getting low in the desert. Water definitely meant life to them. Their food supply was living a little bit to be desired. In fact, it was so bad that the comp people complained that it was miserable. So the people became impatient. The Hebrew word for impatient in this verse also meant just simply to become angry. I guess we'd call it hangry now. The situation was depressing them, and when a group of people become depressed and angry, what do they tend to do? They begin to grumble and complain. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt just to die here in the desert? How quickly the people of God continued to forget all that Yahweh had done for them. Need they be reminded again? He had saved them from enslavement of Egypt, helped them defeat numerous enemies, and provided them with the very food and water that they now complained about. It's no wonder what happened next. The Lord sent these poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them. And many Israelites died. The Hebrew word for poisonous meant something that is burning. The poisonous venom working its way through their bodies, bodies literally burned like fire. So once again, the people of Israel learned their lesson. They learned, they turned to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you, his prophet. Pray to the Lord and take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord listened to their prayers, but did not remove the serpents. But instead, he provided a way to cure everybody when snakes had bitten. The Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it up on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze serpent. And the picture is depicted on the front of your bulletin today. And he put it up on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person could look at the serpent of bronze and live. And now, in our gospel lesson, the backstory is just as crucial to understand the significance. This scene takes place during Nicodemus's nighttime visit, as I already said, in which the Lord explains to him what it takes to be born again. He doesn't understand this concept, and Jesus, with contempt, says, you are a teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, well, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. And then... Jesus refers to Moses lifting up the serpent on the pole as he explains to Nicodemus the manner by which himself, he himself, would die. You see, people lifted Jesus up on a cross. He compared himself with the bronze snake on that pole. Why? Why, Why did Jesus relate himself to this bronze snake? Well, like the poison from the fangs of the snakes in the number story, sin is like a poison. It spreads its way through our bodies, poisoning us, burning us. Everyone is born with a desire to sin because Adam, the first man, did not obey God. 
regardless of how righteously we have lived our lives, we are all sinful creatures. The original sin causes death to our very spirits. It does not allow us to live how God intended us to live. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus says, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. That is why Jesus spoke of being lifted up like the serpent. If we simply believe in him, we won't perish. He could have judged us just as he did by sending the snakes to bite the Israelites. He could have simply killed us all, but he didn't. Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but that he might save us through his sacrifice. Whoever believes in him isn't judged, and whoever doesn't believe in him, who doesn't honor the sacrifice he made for us, well, those people are just, just as dead to poison of sin as the people of Israel were to the poison of snakes. Just as God did not remove the snakes from being in the midst of the people in the desert, God does not remove sin from our world. Instead, he provided a way to cure every person from the results of their sin. And like the Israelites, we too have to do something. We have to look at the cross. We must believe that Jesus died on our behalf. <clears throat> then we will forgive. He will forgive all of our sins. He suffered the punishment that we deserve. And in order to survive the bite of the snake, the Israelites had to look at the bronze snake upon the wooden pole. They had to make that decision themselves. Look at the pole or die. And in order to survive the sins which permeate our lives, we too must look up. We must look up at the cross. Nobody else can look at the cross for us. We must look to the cross, each of us, on our own behalf. Jesus continues in verse 19 through 21. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. As people of Israel looked to the bronze serpent for deliverance, they were acknowledging that they were responsible for bringing the poisonous serpents upon themselves. And in such acknowledgement, they showed their shift in allegiance from themselves as individuals or smaller family groups back to God, to Moses, and the whole of the people. By looking to the bronze serpent, they were joining anew the people from whom their bitter complaining had alienated them. In a similar way, when Jesus would be lifted up on the cross, he would bring salvation to all who acknowledged their role in the reason for his coming in the first place. Sin. Sin separates us from God. Christ's crucifixion restores us into right relationship. <coughs> Excuse me. With God. <coughs> Some translations of the second half of John 16 read that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life into him. That whosoever believes into him will have eternal life. Now that is much more theologically sound than to simply believe in Jesus. What difference does that little word to mean on the end of in that makes it so theologically different? It can be interpreted simply that whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose on the third day will instantly receive eternal life. In other words, our salvation is predicated on our belief alone. But that's not really the intent of Jesus' message. It is by believing into Jesus that one is saved. It becomes an exercise of faith. It means that we place... we that we place absolute trust in our Lord and more importantly, perhaps, we submit our very lives to Him and His authority. We not only believe He is the Son of God who died for our sins and rose on the third day, but we choose to follow Him in His way, 
take up the cross and follow me as we discussed last week. Eternal life is granted to us not because we believe in the right theology, but because we as Jesus' disciples live our lives according to Jesus' teaching. In other words, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Believing into calls us to something more, to life in and through following Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells the church in Ephesus, At one time you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to live like people of this world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience of God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everybody else. In other words, we were dead men and women walking. We were zombies. And what saved us is that God acted. God is rich in mercy, Paul writes. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. God did this to show future generations the greatness, the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God showed us in Christ Jesus. That's the good news, brothers and sisters. God acted and offered us real life in Jesus. God is simply this gracious, this loving, this merciful toward all of us. Deliverance comes as it did in John 3 and our Numbers passage. When we acknowledge that we've been poisoned by sin and cannot fix ourselves and instead trust God's provision through Jesus and surrender unto him. That is not pulling ourselves up. It is surrender. It is believing into. Amen. Now I receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.